So just if everyone could uh, un to mute themselves and close their video, that'd be great. Appreciate it. Um, and hello, I'm Barbara Grabowski, Vice President and Program Director for the League of Women Voters of Greater Pittsburgh. The League of Women Voters of Greater Pittsburgh is a nonpartisan political organization that neither supports nor opposes any candidate or party. With more than 200 members based here in Pittsburgh, we work hard to see that every vote counts and provide citizens in our region with information about how to register to vote, candidate information, resources for voters, candidate forums, civic education in schools, how to spot misinformation and disinformation, publish a guide to local government officials, and have programs such as this evening's presentation on electric vehicles. For more information about what we do, you can check out our website at lwvpgh.org. This evening, we're going to look at electric vehicles, sometimes called EVs. They are an important part of reducing our carbon emissions from our daily activities and the transportation sector. But many of us have lots of questions about what they are and how they work. So we have asked Colton Brown, the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Coordinator for the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, PennDOT, to give us a short course in EVs. You might call it a kind of EV 101, covering the nuts and bolts of EVs, what they are, how they work, how you charge them, and Pennsylvanians' plan for moving to electric vehicles. We received a few questions as part of registration, which we will address at the end. And over the course of the program, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and we'll cover them at the end of the presentation. Um, this evening's program is also being recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel and Pittsburgh Community Television or PCTV later this week. So Colson Brown, um, is the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Coordinator for PennDOT, where he supports the development and implementation of the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Formula Grant Program and leads electric vehicle education initiatives. His previous Commonwealth experience includes managing level two and DC fast charging funding programs. He obtained a Master's of Science in Environmental Planning and Management from Johns Hopkins School of Engineering for Professionals. So let's welcome Colton Brown. All right, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, so yeah, we will definitely uh, walk through the, the EV and 101 and, and charging basics. Um, and, and I'll cover a lot of uh, just, just introductory information, what's going on here in Pennsylvania. Um, and then always the, the most fun time is uh, question and answer at the end. We'll go in any direction you want to, can go um, anything related to electric vehicles, um, gotten into, you know, battery chemistry to discussions, um, all sorts of stuff before. So whatever, whatever your curiosities or things you'd like to learn, um, happy to, to get there at that time. So that, okay, is that coming through all right? Yes, it is. Okay, sounds good. Uh, all right. So, uh, agenda, brief agenda here, um, as I kind of covered. So, uh, first, like to start with, you know, why are we talking about electric vehicles? Why is there a, a big interest, both from industry and uh, government, um, to supporting electric vehicles? Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to uh, the mass adoption of electric vehicles. Uh, we, first and, and foremost, they have greatly reduced emissions as compared to a gasoline vehicle. This does take into account the life cycle emissions as well as the electricity made to power the vehicle. Um, an electric vehicle is inherently much more energy efficient with the energy that it uses. Um, and the uh, the electric grid comes from a, a diverse uh, a variety of 11 people. I knew this was not going to be a popular program. Eileen, could you mute yourself, please? Um, 
Yeah, so uh, the, our electricity comes from a, a diverse set of sources. So um, therefore, it, it's not all um, fossil fuel based that's powering our vehicles and that, that really reduces the, the emissions intensity of an electric vehicle. Uh, because they have no tailpipe emissions, that means that they can greatly reduce uh, traffic or um, uh, they can greatly improve air quality in our dense urban areas where traffic is often uh, the predominant cause of poor air quality. Uh, furthermore, as in like as electric over time, uh, electric vehicle emissions actually reduce because our electric grid continues to reduce in its emission intensity. Gasoline vehicle will emit the same every mile of its lifetime. On electric vehicle, will continue to get cleaner over time. Uh, there's some economic benefits associated with electric vehicles. Um, while for now they still have a higher upfront purchase price, um, they do cost less to fuel and maintain than. Uh, comparable gasoline vehicle. Uh, charging an electric vehicle in Pennsylvania currently on, on an average residential electricity price um, costs you the equivalent of paying um, between about a dollar a quarter to a dollar fifty per gallon of gas. Um, so it's a lot less on fuel and overall maintenance costs are um, studies have found that to be about 40 percent less in electric vehicle. So even though um, even now while they cost more upfront um, typically, there you will have uh, an, a total uh, reduced expenditure on an electric vehicle over its lifetime. Additionally, uh, electricity comes from your local utility, so money spent on electricity stays in our local and regional economies, whereas money spent on fossil fuels can be going to other countries. If we make the transition to electric vehicles uh, well, then we also have the potential to onshore um, a number of jobs related to um, charging stations, production of vehicles, production of batteries, et cetera. So those are some of the benefits of electric vehicles. Then we, we like to define what do we mean when we say an electric vehicle. Most of us are uh, pretty familiar with our conventional gasoline or diesel vehicles. Sorry. And over the last uh, couple of decades, we've also become pretty familiar with our regular hybrid vehicles. So a regular hybrid um, basically adds a, a small uh, electric motor, a small electric battery uh, to that gasoline vehicle, and it enables a number of uh, fuel efficiency advantages. Um, primarily, it enables regenerative braking. So anytime the vehicle is slowing down, rather than losing all of that energy, um, to heat and friction, um, the battery actually has to recapture it and use it to power the vehicle forward um, the next time the vehicle is, is uh, accelerating. Uh, so that's why a hybrid vehicle will get much better gas mileage. That all being said, uh, some manufacturers, some sources will call a regular hybrid and electric vehicle. For our discussion here this evening, we are not including regular hybrid vehicles when we, when we say an electric vehicle. We are only referring to our plug-in hybrids and our battery electric vehicles. Fuel cell hydrogen would also um, count as well, uh, but essentially something that plugs into an external source of electricity so that it can power an electric only miles um, is what we mean when we say electric. So a plug-in hybrid um, is just like the, the regular hybrid, but it has a much larger battery pack so that it plugs in, um, goes in electric only miles, then once the battery is uh, relatively low, it will function like a normal hybrid. Battery electric vehicle is where uh, most of our sales in electric vehicles are right now. They completely drop the internal combustion engine. It only has a battery and electric motor. Um, it's where we see the full benefit of electrification um, because you, you, it's only at that point that you get the reduced maintenance costs because you no longer have oil changes, many fewer moving parts. Um, you're only using electricity, so you get the full fuel savings, things like that. So with that introduction, um, most questions will then uh, relate to the charging of electric vehicles. It is a very different uh, concept to fuel our vehicles with electricity as compared to uh, gasoline or other fossil fuels. Um, it's more nuanced because there's different ways that we can do it. So level one charging, uh, commonly referred to as a trickle charge for a vehicle, is when it's plugged into a regular wall outlet. Uh, all electric vehicles are capable of doing this. They all come with a cord um, that, that lets you do that so you can drive it home and plug it right in. Um, it is pretty slow. You'll generally receive uh, three to five miles of vehicle range per hour that you're charging that way. 
Um, that sounds too slow to ever be worth bothering with, um, but it, it actually does meet the needs of, of many people. Um, in particular, plug-in hybrids will often only have a range of 30 to 40 miles. Uh, so this works perfectly if you're able to charge that way at home overnight or during the day at work. Um, but even a lot of electric vehicle owners, <laughs> most people only drive 30, 40, or 50 miles a day. So if your car has 10 hours overnight each night to be charging this way, um, it, it often will meet your needs. And as long as you have some sort of supplemental charging at work along your uh, common uh, route, along your common trips, um, for what those those times that you do travel longer, um, it, it can work out uh, well. Uh, many people who could put in faster charging at home will, will choose not to just because the level one works for them. Um, that all being said, level two charging is by far the most common form of charging for electric vehicles. Uh, simple way to think about this is it's your it's your standard 220 line, like a dryer outlet um, or uh, or an electric oven. Uh, so um, just at a higher amperage. So generally it's 220 volts at about 15 or 20 amps for a dryer. This is more commonly somewhere between 30 and 50 amps. So this will get you somewhere between 20 and 30 miles of vehicle range per hour that you would charge this way. That's enough that even if you, uh, you know, had your battery close to empty in a given day, um, which is not common, uh, you could still get a full charge at home overnight or at work during the day in those eight hours or, or more that the vehicle is, is sitting there. So if you're able to charge at home or at work with a level two charge, um, the average driver that will meet 97% of your charging needs and you will need to drive else, charge elsewhere very seldomly. Lastly, we have DC fast charging, which as it sounds like is the very fast way to charge. Um, it has two primary locations that you'll find DC fast charging. One is along interstates and other major roadways for those few times of the year that we do travel much longer distances in a single day. So that way you can charge it quickly um, and, and be back on your way. Most DC fast charging is designed to get you most of the way full in about 20 to 30 minutes. And the other place that we'll see a lot of DC fast charging is in communities that have a lot of individuals who cannot charge at home, such as uh, apartments and multi other multi-unit dwellings. Um, so they'll rely on community-based DC fast charging uh, for many of their charging needs, such as charging at uh, a mall or a grocery store, other places that they're commonly visiting. You see here in the middle, we have a couple of different plug types. The plug types are largely um, standardized at this point. Tesla does use their own charging plug, um, but everybody else uses the J1772 and the CCS which is really one charging port. CCS is just two extra pins at the bottom for your DC fast charging. And Tesla is able to use those plug types uh, via adapters. So really anytime that, that a government source is funding charging stations, they'll stick with that left column um, because it ensures anyone is able to use the charging station. And lastly, as we think about charging, uh, fueling our vehicles with electricity, it really is a paradigm shift in how we go about fueling our vehicles. We're used to fueling with a fossil fuel where we stand by the vehicle for five minutes while it fuels. Um, and it's, it's therefore an active process. It takes our time to do so. Charging happens while we do other things. Um, we're either at home, uh, you know, doing other things, sleeping, we're at work, we're shopping. And even those few times when we're traveling really long distances and need to stop for a pit stop along the highway, um, we're probably gonna have just been driving for three hours and we go inside and we have a meal and we go to the bathroom. And so the vehicle is always charging while we're doing other things. So charging should not add time to our routine. It shouldn't, um, it shouldn't, it shouldn't take our time. It should happen while we're doing other things. So there are now over uh, 3,700 plug 50 locations throughout Pennsylvania for public charging. Um, most of those are level two, uh, and um, some of them would only be for Tesla vehicles. Most of them are using those uh, plug types for, for everyone. There's a variety of ways that an electric vehicle driver can find and access these charging stations. There are apps, um, the 511 PA website. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of that has those, uh, those charging stations built into it. Um, and uh, there's uh, 
websites and many times there there's even built in support in the vehicle itself. Um, if you already use the, the vehicles uh, navigation system, um, then it may and, and it determines that you're traveling farther than its range is, it, it may suggest to you charging stations along the way. So also on this map, you can see there's some shading that just shows you the relative density of electric vehicles uh, registered in Pennsylvania. The white areas do still have electric vehicles. It's just um, in a lower concentration than the other areas. And lastly, on our electric vehicle introduction, um, we just have the, the sales that have been happening in Pennsylvania over the last number of years. As you can see, we are we are truly at that inflection point where they're starting to take off. Um, we're seeing you know continued growth. Most quarters beat the quarter the record from the previous quarter in terms of total sales and market share. Last year, uh, four point five percent of new light duty vehicles sold in Pennsylvania were electric, um, and that'll they'll certainly continue to rise here. Um, because there's a long turnover rate in uh, vehicles, um, it is still less than 1% of vehicles on the road in Pennsylvania that are electric. Uh, we do expect that they will top that 1% mark uh, sometime yet this year. Okay, so we'll now transition into some of the things that Pennsylvania is doing to um, support uh, the, the increased use of electric vehicles. So um, last year, uh, Penn, uh, PennDOT released the EV mobility plan. This was this really took the um, EV roadmap that was developed by DP a couple of years before uh, by our Department Department of Environmental Protection here in Pennsylvania. Um, the EV roadmap was was essentially recommendations for how to increase the adoption of electric vehicles in Pennsylvania. This uh, e, the mobility plan went the next step into um, you know facilitating. Uh, transportation and the mobility of electric vehicles in Pennsylvania. Uh, so it had a number of recommendations, including, you know, more charging stations, more locations throughout the state, um, but also things such as, you know, having the availability of mobile charging units for emergencies or um, events that may draw much larger crowds to a particular area than its, than its uh, charging capacity may be able to handle. Penda also uh, in, in uh, a Temple University uh, graduate class um, worked with PennDOT to develop an EV model ordinance toolkit. This is a, a, a tool for local governments um, looking to support the adoption of electric vehicles and charging stations um, has a number of best practices for them to look to if they're interested in that. Okay, so the, the big one here uh, is the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this is the, the big program that will help get, uh, you know, charging um, uh, really taking off here uh, in Pennsylvania and nationally. So the infrastructure law passed in 2021 included $5 billion for this program. Um, and those funds go by formula to each state Department of Transportation. So in Pennsylvania here, our share of that funding is $171.5 million. That comes over the course of five years. We have unlocked the first two years of that funding, about $62 million, by completing Pennsylvania's uh, NEVI re required NEVI state plan. Um, and uh, we're one of the first states to, to get that program kind of up and running and available for people to pursue that funding. We had the first round of our funding program open um, over the last couple of months, just closed earlier this month. Um, and you know, all of my time goes into uh, reviewing the uh, 271 submissions that we received uh, seeking that funding. So this program by law, each state DOT is required to first use their funds for building out a network of high power DC fast charging along our interstate highways and other major designated roadways. So each station that we fund at this point is required to have at least four plugs, all using that CCS connector we talked about earlier. And each plug has to be capable of 150 kilowatt output per plug simultaneously. So that's 600 kilowatts of power per charging, uh, per charging location. We have to put these uh, chargers, these charging stations within one mile of a highway exit and no more than 50 miles to the next mile, to the next station. 
So only after completing that build out um, along all of the, the roadways that you see here um, noted, only after completing that build out will the federal government approve us being built out. And then we will be allowed to use our NEVI funds for public charging stations in other locations and at different power levels. So you can see um, our alter alternative fuel corridors, as they're called, is largely our interstate um, highways, as well as a couple other portions of some other major roadways that we have designated. So the way that we have structured this first round of our NEVI program, um, we've broken all of those interstate highways into what we call corridor groups. Each corridor group is approximately, um, it varies, but about 25 miles in length. Um, the reason being that 50 miles is a long distance to go in between uh, billing locations. So our goal is to have some redundancy and be closer to 25 miles um, that there that there'd be a station. So um, with each interstate broken up into these 25 mile groupings, um, we then prioritized each one of those groups into one, two, or three. Priority three means that we already have one of these high power stations within that corridor group, so we would not need another one. Priority two means it's close to an existing station, so it could help for redundancy to have one. We don't need one of these stations in that area. And a priority one means those are the locations most likely to help us achieve this build out requirement. So within each of these corridor groups, if you were to zoom in on our interactive map, you would see one mile polygons off of each exit. So those one mile polygons designate the, lo designate the locations that are eligible to apply for the funds because they're within the one mile of the highway. And the corridor group bubble tells you the exits that are competing against each other for a single award through this first round of our program. So we're first looking to fund a project at each of our priority one corridor groups, followed by our priority two corridor groups. Uh, here's just a quick timeline of this first round of our program. I realize it's a little bit busy, but you know the important dates here is you know May 5th is when our program closed. Um, we received a lot of interest. It'll be in July that we're hoping to, through the process of scoring all of those projects, um, selecting uh, the, the sites that we're that we're going to award. Um, then we'll have to go through some some federal environmental uh, process, um, environmental review processes, and we hope to get the projects to um, contract agreement signed and those to proceed uh, this fall. Each project would then have up to two years to complete their um, construction installation, as it can take a while to get the the utility power to the site, as well as uh, supply chain delays on the equipment. Um, sorry, and following that, the other important um, timeline piece is that uh, each one of these stations is required to be um, operational for five years. So that would be the amount of time that we have essentially a contractual requirement on these uh, on the funding recipients that they maintain a 97% uptime of the charging station um, and can and complete quarterly and annual reporting to us for those charging stations. So we would um, maintain that that financial and contractual relationship uh, for that time period. And then, um, you know, and then after that, ideally, they're going to continue operating the charging station considering they put a lot of investment into it. Um, and we anticipate that to, to happen for most or all of them. So throughout the public engagement process that we did before this program opened, um, we received uh, a lot of feedback. Um, one of the things that we heard consistently was to have a transparent um, scoring and selection process. So you can see the, the overall points and broken up by category, um, but within each of these categories, we do have a full scoring rubric that, that lets um, organizations pursuing this funding know exactly how they will be scored and evaluated against each other um, for determining those successful projects. So I'm not going to move on to some other um, initiatives and programs that are, are in Pennsylvania here uh, for electric vehicles. So um, uh, less than a year ago, I was actually still working at DEP on many of these uh, programs. So uh, they, I kind of have uh, permission to continue talking about their programs since that's what I was doing when I was there. Um, this is a snapshot of some of the major initiatives uh, our environmental agency has uh, related to electric vehicles. I'll touch on most of them in more detail on the later slides here. So I mentioned earlier, DEP had the electric vehicle roadmap in 2019 that had 13 
recommendations for increasing electric vehicle adoption. There is also a 2021 update to that that is in a booklet format. So it's a good, um, just quick resource for electric vehicle basics and some of the things going on in Pennsylvania. We do also have the Drive Electric Pennsylvania Coalition. That's really um, uh, coordinated by DEP and PennDOT jointly. Uh, we put on quarterly meetings, um, most of the time virtual, where people can just learn what's happening with electric vehicles in Pennsylvania and nationally. Uh, so it's it's a very informal. Um, it's not it's not like a formal organization or anything. It's open to anyone. So you can check that out. You can get added to the email list if you're interested. So DEP's most uh, popular program for electric vehicles is um, likely their level two rebate program. So this is available to any organization eligible to do business in Pennsylvania, uh, nonprofit, profit, government, um, and any any parking space um, for the most part uh, is, is eligible. Um, there's a few exceptions to that. But projects in public spaces, workplaces, or multi-unit dwellings are eligible to pursue the level two rebate program. And as long as you meet the requirements, you're you're given a rebate um, and you have time to complete your project. And then once it's completed, you submit for uh, the reimbursement based on that rebate. So it has funded over 1,800 level two clubs um, so far throughout Pennsylvania. It's an overview of the available funding incentives for the for the program. I'm not going to go into too much detail there since it's only for um, organizations to apply. Um, but basically, you know, public access projects are eligible for the most funding per plug, and workplace projects would be eligible for the least. Here is two other programs available through DEP. Uh, the first on the left here, the Alternative Fuels Incentive Grant Program is for fleet vehicles to transition to alternative fuels. So that would include you know, our CNG and propane, but it also includes electric. So it can up with the incremental purchase price of those vehicles um, and or up to 50% of the cost of putting in the fueling infrastructure for them. So it's a competitive grant program, opens up each year. Um, generally it opens uh, around late spring. So we're in close to this year's window um, is then open through most of the remainder of the calendar year. Program on the right is the main program that we have in Pennsylvania for individuals. So this is for individuals who purchase an electric vehicle, either new or one-time pre-owned. Uh, it is a low and middle income rebate. So essentially you have to be at or under the median income in Pennsylvania to uh, be eligible. For a family size of one, that's about 54,000 per year. And for a family size of four, it's about 111,000 per year. Um, so there's a table for all the different family sizes um, in the program document that gives you an, a sense of who's eligible. Um, if you're if you're in that lower middle income class uh, income class, then uh, it's two thousand dollars for a new or used electric vehicle and fifteen hundred for a new or used plug-in hybrid. Um, there's a one thousand dollar adder onto that if uh, the household income is under two hundred percent of federal poverty line. DP uh, recently uh, completed uh, the EV rate design study. So they uh, funded a contractor to uh, look into this. Basically, um, overview is that, you know, uh, if, we, if we don't do anything to manage the increased load of electric vehicles uh, charging and on the electric grid, then it could have some, some serious negative consequences. If it's a really hot summer day and electric grid is already strained, everybody comes home and plugs in at mm -hmm. five o'clock, then, then we have a problem. Um, but if through appropriate uh, price signals, through the way that we pay for electricity, uh, people who have the flexibility to charge at different times, um, whether at work or at home, um, if they know that it's gonna be really cheap for me to charge overnight, then I'll just schedule my charging station to, to turn on at midnight and they get home, they plug in, but it doesn't actually start charging. It waits until midnight when the grid has plenty of extra capacity. Um, and so if we do that appropriately, we not only avoid those negative consequences, but we actually make the electric grid more efficient for everybody. Because if we decrease the differences between our peak times of peak demand and our times of low demand, we basically even out the demand on the grid I mean, we more efficiently use those grid assets and it reduces electricity prices for everybody, regardless of whether they drive an electric vehicle. So that's one example of some of the things that that study looked into. But it's also been used as kind of a, a jumping board for our Pennsylvania's Public Utility Commission. Uh, they have an EV rate design working group 
um, that, that propose some recommendations to uh, the PUC commissioners. Um, and they'll now be considering if they want to issue a policy statement to our public utilities um, on if they should be implementing EV rate designs. So th that summarizes our state programs. I'm just gonna provide a snapshot of some of the major federal funding opportunities. I will note here that I'm only covering the federal programs that are directly or um, that, are, that are wholly or primarily for electric vehicles. Um, there are a number of different programs and, and funding opportunities that were created through the infrastructure law as well as the Inflation Reduction Act um, that have electric vehicles as an eligible project type among one of many things. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to focus on the ones that are kind of like the, the major ones we expect to have an impact on, on electric vehicles. So first and foremost is our tax credits created through the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I will note that the overall theme here is it made our electric vehicle tax credits uh, a lot more complicated. Um, now, the ones that we had were pretty much gone at, or were going to be gone within a couple of years. So it is, it is great that we have these available, um, but they are a bit more um, difficult to navigate. So the 7,500 federal income tax credit for buying a new electric vehicle, it's still there. There's a lot of restrictions now, though. Um, one major restriction went away, which is that there's no longer a 200,000 limit per manufacturer. Um, so Tesla and GM vehicles are now eligible for tax credits again. Um, but we have uh, income limits. We have purchase price limit. Uh, there's limits on how, on if the vehicle model will be available based on how it's manufactured. So the important thing here is before you would buy an electric vehicle thinking that you're going to get this tax credit, go to the IRS's website, see if that vehicle is on the list of eligible models as well as confirm to make sure that you would be within the income limits and that the vehicle purchase price is, is under the, the maximum. Really big important change that'll, that'll be impactful for this program is that beginning January 1st of next year, the incentive can be claimed at the time of purchase rather than waiting for um, your, your tax return the following year. Considering you know, over 90% of vehicle purchases, um, it's really the car payment that matters more than, than the, the amount. Um, this will have a much bigger impact on, on really incentivizing uh, an electric vehicle purchase. Here we have the two new tax credits created through the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, the first one is very similar to the one I just talked about. It's just for used electric vehicles. So the the limit, it's, it's only 4,000 instead of 7,500. Um, there's some, again, a lot of restrictions. Make sure you check the website. Uh, but many of the same things apply, just like the January 1st, uh, starting January 1st, the incentive can be at time of purchase as opposed to when completing your tax return. Uh, a really big one here is we now have a tax credit for the purchase of commercial electric vehicles. This is very important because before uh, our government entities had no way to take advantage of the tax credit because they don't pay income taxes. But this has a provision that if tax exempt organizations can apply directly to the IRS for a rebate. So it will make it much easier for our local and state governments to transition their own fleets to electric vehicles. Uh, lastly, we do also still have the tax credit for installing uh, charging or, or other alternative fuel infrastructure. Um, the major new restriction here is that the property must be in a rural or low income census tract to be eligible. Um, we did not have that restriction before, so a lot of places cannot claim it. But if you are in one of those census tracts, then an individual installing a charging station at home can get 30% or $1,000 back, whichever is less um, on their tax return. And um, there's also the commercial tax credit, which has its own rules and restrictions. Um, but again, our tax exempt entities are now eligible to claim it for the first time. So that could be very beneficial for them. All right, I know the tax credits are, are so much fun. So moving on to, to our other major federal programs, uh, we have a clean school bus program, basically $5 billion for uh, the purchase of clean or zero emission school buses over the course of five years. First round of that program saw such high demand that they awarded twice as many much funds as they were planning to. Uh, so they awarded $1 billion and based on application, the way applications came in, 90% um, of that was for electric school buses. That's where all the demand was. This year's program is currently open. Um, this one will be a competitive program rather than rebate based. Um, and it's focusing much more on large projects 
rather than the first one that allowed ones and twos for um, school buses. Uh, the charging and fueling infrastructure grant program, it's largely the companion to that NEVI program we talked about earlier. Um, it's 2.5 billion, though the difference is that it is administered directly by the federal government. It's competitive nationwide and it's only for government entities to apply to. Um, so it is, it's a little bit different. It's, uh, uh, we're, we're finding our, our own difficulties with it. Um, it's usually private entities that are used to um, chasing funds for charging stations and, and managing them. Um, but it is, it is still going to be a helpful way for um, governments to, to support charging infrastructure rollout. Um, and, and there's also provisions that um, it can still be passed along the, the operations and ownership it can still be passed along to the private entity by the time of the uh, the end of the five years required operations. Um, so the program is split into two uh, categories. This, this first round of the program is 700 million split half and half between community alternative fuels and corridor alternative fuels. Um, so I won't get into too much detail on that, but but essentially, you know, some of it will be for our highways and some of it will be for community. So uh, the community will be important since uh, NEVI is not allowed to fund charging, sta charging stations off of the highways um, until after we receive that build out, and that could be a couple of years. So in conclusion, um, here's just a snapshot of a number of those incentives that we covered. Sorry. Uh, I'll leave that up for a moment um, and then can take it to uh, take it to questions. I'll turn it back over to you. All right. All right. That was a lot of information, and um, I I really appreciate what you were able to to share with us this evening. Um, I I live in Swissvale, and our borough council has been working with Duquesne Light and some other organizations uh, to get public charging stations located here, because like many parts of Pittsburgh, people don't have a garage in our street parking. So you really can't have a cord going across the sidewalk up onto your porch. So it's been really great to see um, these projects get going to help communities you know, start, start putting the infrastructure and, and planning in place to help their, their citizens. We um, had a couple of questions. I'm going to interrupt a second. Sure. Would we like everybody to turn their videos on so that we can all see each other asking questions? Would that be all right, Barbara? Sure. Okay, so everybody turn your video back on. So we had a couple questions uh, that were asked um, when folks uh, signed up. Um, and one of them was what unfavorable rumors about EVs um, are, are real or unreal. Un unfortunately, I'm not sure what the unfavorable rumors are, but perhaps you have answered that uh, a question along those lines before in terms of sort of um, fact um, or fiction about electric cars. Sure. So there's there's certainly a lot. I've I've been around to hear a lot of of different um a lot of different things, and yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, um, there's there's going to be a lot that have no founding, and there's also a lot where you know the truth is in the middle. Um, you know, their electric vehicles are not perfect. They're not the solution to everything. Um, they are, uh, you know, they're a great stepping stone. They're definitely in the right direction, and they work in a lot of cases. Um, late duty vehicles in particular, you know, late duty vehicles, most of the time spend 90% of their time idle. So it's, it's easy to incorporate charging into the use of an electric vehicle and it still perform everything that it needs to, um, you know, long haul tractor trailers probably will never be battery electric. Um, 20,000 pound batteries just, you know, it's not really practical. You, you just took away a quarter of, of the freight load of that vehicle. And now you have to run more tractor trailers. Um, it's not to say that we don't have solutions. We could we could fuel those um, long haul tractor trailers with um, at least CNG, potentially RNG, renewable natural gas. Um, there's hydrogen fuel cell 
Um, but those are, those are going to be longer solutions. Um, in any case, getting back to the to the question, um, yeah, I, I can go into any number of things, but there's there's too many to uh, just just remember all of them and, and pick through them at, at on the spot. Okay. And a, a similar question was uh, the environmental impacts from hard rock mining for lithium and the other uh, materials needed for the batteries and and manufacturing batteries. How, how does that balance out in terms of the benefits from an electric car? Yeah, so um, essentially because there is increased uh, environmental emissions and um, impacts going into the manufacturing of an electric vehicle, it, it means that, that the day you buy an electric vehicle, it's like you had driven a gasoline vehicle about 20,000 miles. But that electric vehicle um, has about one third of the emissions when you're operating it. So by the time you hit 30,000 miles, you hit your break even point, and then everything past that, your net lower environmental impact. Uh, I might be a little bit off there. It might be a little bit faster now um, as, as, the, as they, they improve all of those things. But, but essentially, like, yes, there, there is some level of, of increased activity that goes into making the vehicle. Uh, what, we, what we call rare earth metals um, is, is, a big, uh, it's, it's a big and complicated topic when we talk about making the electric vehicle batteries. So lithium is, is, not, is not that hard or complicated. The lithium is, is more abundant than most of the other rare earth metals that would go into a battery. It comes from different places in the world. Um, we do have a lot of lithium mines that will need to be coming online in the coming years. Um, I've heard a number of places that, you know, the late 2020s is kind of going to be our, our crunch point because it takes 10 to 15 years to get a mine online. And so we could have, you know, trouble meeting lithium demand for those years. Um, but once the new mines start coming online 2030, um, we should be good to go. Um, and in particular, when we start harvesting these, the, when we start developing these resources from developed nations, um, they're, they're going to have a lower environmental impact. You know, we can avoid labor abuses, we can avoid um, our, our environmental impacts. Um, and also when we talk about lithium, it, it's not always a mine in the way we think about it. The one functioning mine for lithium that we have in this country actually pulls up brine from subsurface and evaporates the water. So it's, it's not like an open surface mine that, that we're used to thinking about. The other rare earth metals, it's much more complicated. Um, nickel, uh, manganese, cobalt are the most common that will go into electric vehicle. Manganese comes from Australia. We don't worry about that one. Uh, nickel comes from a lot of less friendly parts of the world. So, so we do concern about that one. And particularly cobalt is almost entirely coming from Democratic Republic of Congo, where they have labor abuse problems and almost all of the refining rights are in China. So cobalt is one that we really try to minimize in our batteries. Um, but there's there's a lot of solutions here. We have different battery chemistries that either greatly reduce or eliminate our need for those metals. So that's that's a big point of, of research and development. Um, some manufacturers are already making what we call lithium iron phosphate batteries that do not use um, any um, cobalt. So they, they eliminate that from their from their use. Um, and there's there's other potentials. I just read something today about lithium sulfur batteries, which they anticipate could start being used in vehicles by 2030. And that will eliminate all of our rare metal earth needs aside from lithium. So. Thank you. That's a very that. long way to answer that question. <laughs> no, I I. I... I've been following the issue of um, hard rock mining, um, particularly out west, where it's a big issue for some of the tribal nations, Nez Perce, for example, with, with a, a pending application to open a new hard rock mine in that area of the country. And I believe that there is a at the federal level a task force of the the several different federal agencies who each have a piece of hard rock mining for for these minerals. So it, it is um, it, it's a it's a important issue, but I think you also spelled out how complicated it can get. Yes, and there's there's lots of 
you know, smaller funding programs, but still important investments going into either researching how we make batteries that don't need those things or into, you know, how we can, um, you know, obtain those materials through environmentally friendly means, through, you know, reducing impact on disadvantaged populations, you know, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of um, emphasis and, and work being done in those spaces. Um, it's one of those things like you don't know what the solution is going to be at the end of the tunnel, but there's so many things being pursued. It's hard to imagine none of them working out well. <laughs> we had a question about uh, what are the fire hazards of an electric car? Yeah, so this is a fun one. So, um, you know, we already went into to some some battery chemistry, 200 level stuff, so we can do a little bit more. Uh, when we talk about a battery, there's a cathode, an anode, and in the middle, there's a separator. Um, that separator is the reason that you did not have lithium ion rechargeable batteries until the last decade. Um, it was not until around you know, 2005, 2010 that um, engineers figured out how to make a, a separator that held up through the recharging process to get lithium ion batteries to the point that we could recharge them safely. There are obviously, you know, there's there's always going to be some level of risk. It really comes down to the way the battery is manufactured. So, you know, we had the Chevy Bolt fires, um, and that was because um, there had to be two defects present in the same battery, and then it allowed it, it resulted in that separator not functioning the way it was supposed to. The battery forms dendrites that connects the anode and the cathode. You have a short circuit, and all of the energy is instantly dispelled and turned into heat. So while that was in the news and it was a massive recall, even then, Chevy had made 140,000 volts. We know of 12 that caught fire. So even in our worst case scenario, not very many. Um, the most common time that an electric vehicle battery could catch fire is if the battery is heavily damaged. Um, even, in, even most accidents are unlikely to result in the battery catching on fire. Um, it's, it's more common if you do something like uh, driving over a curb isn't gonna do it either, but if there's like an accident where the electric vehicle winds up uh, driving up to a guardrail and that guardrail slices the, the steel below, protecting the bottom of the battery, cuts it open, then you could have the battery catch on fire. So it, it, when it happens, you know, it's, it's certainly a major thing because it's much harder to put out a battery than it is to put out um, a gasoline vehicle. I actually got to go to a training a couple of weeks ago on um, electric vehicle battery fires. It was very interesting. Um, learned some things that that all of our firefighters should know, and that's one of the things we need to do is get that information out there. Anytime you see a news article that someone spent more than 10,000 gallons of water trying to put out an electric vehicle battery fire, it means they didn't know how to do it right. <laughs> is the thing that is, was my main takeaway. Uh, it's it's counterintuitive. You actually need to put the water in the cabin of the vehicle, not spray at the bottom of the vehicle. The bottom of the vehicle has steel protecting the battery. You're never gonna get there. You actually put it in through the cabin. You do that, you don't need near as much water. So we, we have a lot to learn. Um, some of those other battery chemistries we talked about, they don't catch fire. Lithium iron phosphate batteries, they have next to zero fire risk, even if they're damaged. So there's, um, there's a lot to be done there. You know, At the end of the day, whether it's through battery chemistry or other safety measures in the battery, uh, we need we need to make batteries that just don't catch fire. You know, at the end of the day, there's there's ways to do that. Uh, it might take regulation. Um, I don't know, but but we'll get there. Much more commonly, you'll see lithium ion batteries in your household electronics um, or in your smaller transportation devices. You know, the scooters, the e-bikes, and what that comes from is is they are much less regulated. That battery is more likely to come from a country who is making it cheap and cheap and quick quick. Um, and it's going to be much more prone to, to catching fire that way. Um, you know, for, as an example, you have to make lithium ion batteries in an insanely dry room. I, I believe you are, you're supposed to be under four parts per million of moisture in the air, which is pretty hard to do when people are breathing in the room. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that kind of dry room environment, when you're making the battery, it's going to be prone to fires and, mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that they're made in those sorts of places. We had a question about what is a plug-in hybrid? 
Yeah, plug-in hybrid is is kind of like the the middle ground. Sometimes thought of as the bridge between the regular hybrid and the all electric. Um, sometimes people will start with a, a plug-in hybrid before they would make the plunge to all electric. But it, but it means that it has um, it has everything of both vehicles, right? It has it has a, a large enough battery that it can plug in, that it can travel in some electric only miles, usually somewhere between 20 and 50 electric only miles, but then it still has the full gasoline system. So it will switch over to be a gasoline vehicle when that battery gets close to empty. Um, so the best way I think about plug-in hybrid is it has all of the advantages and all of the disadvantages of both fuel types because you're carrying both of them with you at all times. So you still have the oil changes of the gasoline vehicle, you still have a battery in there. You have two systems that have to talk to each other, so they can be more prone to electrical complications or you know some some maintenance issues like that. But you also have the advantages of both, which is that you can get, um, you know, you can travel in electric miles most of the time, or as, as much as you can through your charging habits, um, and you still have the gasoline backup. So it's it's everything good and everything bad about both of them. We had a question. Uh... Along the lines of now, if you run out of gas, you can call AAA. Will AAA come and give you a, a, a enough of a boost for your battery to get you to the next charging station? Yeah, so the AAA in the Harrisburg region and in the Philadelphia region um, have mobile chargers. So they will come to you with a charger um, and get you charged up enough that you could get to a charging station. Um, if your local AAA does not have a mobile charger, then they will tow you to a charging station. Um, and, and that's, you know, basically the, our, our solutions at this point. Um, our other new solution that is going to continue to become more and more common is that um, most of the electric truck models that are coming out have the ability to charge another vehicle at a level two speed using their own battery. So, um, it's not too fast, you know, you'll get like 10 to 15 miles of range per hour that you charge that way. But you know, most of the time there, there's ideally going to be a way to charge within that distance. So, you know, you're you're someone you know with electric truck comes out, they sit with you for a half hour and then and then you drive a couple miles to get where you need to go. When you're uh charging your car uh at one of the public charging stations, what is the cost? Is there is is there a cost? And what, how much would it cost you? Yeah, so it will vary tremendously. Um, you can have shopping malls or other places that really want to draw you in. They may make it free because honestly, what they're going to get from charging you for the electricity is not that much. They would rather have you come inside and spend money than, than try to get a couple of dollars off of you at the charging station. Most of the time, you're going to pay something. Um, most of the time, you're going to pay something at least similar to what you pay at home, if not more. If it is a DC fast charging station, it's almost guaranteed that you're going to be paying something, probably two to three times what you'd be paying at home. So DC fast charging stations um, are commonly priced so that you're paying kind of comparable to if you were fueling with gasoline. But again, most of the time you're not at a DC fast charging station, so you still work out in the end spending much less on your on your total electricity um, if that's if that's not your your normal way to charge. And is is that part of uh, PUC? Is there, uh, I guess, jurisdiction to regulate or consider regulating, you know, charging rates for public charging stations? No. So the the PUC ruled in 2017, I believe, that uh, a charging station is not a um, basically a distributor of electricity. So they are not subject to PUC regulation. It is entirely up to whoever owns the charging station to decide what that is. Um, and, and it's good that they did so. That that would have been a very onerous process to everyone with a public charging station to register as a utility with the PUC mm -hmm. and be regulated as such. Yeah. So it's sort of up to the free the market to decide what people will charge and what people are willing to pay, enable to pay. Correct. And and so for the time being, you know, that can be problematic because there are so few charging stations. It, it largely looks like a monopoly. Um, you know, you, you have this place to charge. What, what are they going to charge you? It's kind of up to them. Um, that will change over time. You know, eventually we will have a, a charging station on both sides of the highway and you can pick which one to go to and you can look at your phone to see which one's cheaper. Um, that's that's what the NEVI program is, is supposed to get us in that direction. You know, the NEVI program is first Let's build the network. 
so that people can go where they need to when they need to. And then once the network is there, people feel confident buying their electric vehicles, there'll be enough of them that the private market will take over and start funding more of the stations with, with, uh, with their own investments. Here in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, G Giant Eagle is a giant grocery store and they have a part of their business also has uh, gasoline stations. Um, and I think out in Harrisburg, there's a Turkey Hill is similar, I think. Uh, is there, so is there any interest on the part of uh, Giant Eagle or Turkey Hill or large companies like that, that now have lots of gas stations all over town to switch their gasoline dispensers for public charging stations? Yeah, so in general, um, when we talk about the, the gasoline, the convenience stores across the country, um, they have a lot of interest in providing electric vehicle charging. Um, and, and there's kind of two reasons there. One is that, you know, if eventually most vehicles are electric and all they sell is gas, they, they don't really have a business anymore. And the second being that for a long time, for the last couple of decades, gas stations don't really make money on gas anymore. They make money when you come inside. Um, their, their pricing structure is such that they, they make a couple cents per gallon on the gas, if that. They're, they're really trying to get you inside because that's where they make the money. And if it's a charging station, you know, when, when people shows up for gas, they, they stand at the vehicle, they fuel as we talked about, and then most of the time they drive away. Sometimes they come inside, most of the time they drive away. If it's a charging station, you're stuck there for 20, 30 minutes. The, the, the odds that you're going to come inside are way higher. So that's why they <laughs> love charging stations. Sure. Um, Giant Eagle has uh, a couple of grants through DEP to put in charging stations. I don't know if any of those are completed yet, but I know they are in process. Um, Sheets has a couple uh, uh, grants through DEP for charging stations um, and, and national chains do too. Like I've done this webinar for the Pennsylvania Petroleum Association of all organizations because, you know, they it, it'll play into their business model eventually too. We had a couple variations on uh, sort of the economics of buying an electric car. One I can relate to is someone in their sixth decade who has a Prius, which still works just fine and has no garage. Uh, and at what, what point does it make sense uh, for someone who's retired or maybe only drives 50 miles a week of that to invest in an electric car? Yeah, so I mean, as, as we talked about, you know, the electric vehicle has a higher purchase price, and then you save on the operations. So if you don't really have an operation side, it, it's going to be harder to hit net savings. Um, you know, the, the Priuses are great, you know, you're, you're still using a lot less gas than you would be on a regular vehicle. Um, and if you're not using the vehicle much, then like we talked about that, that battery does have more impact than than a standard gasoline vehicle. So the Prius has just a very small battery. So it's possible that for now, that is the way to minimize their environmental impact. Um, like I said, electric vehicles aren't, you know, the answer currently for, for everything. Um, you know, they, they solve a lot of, they're, they're the best in a lot of applications, um, and then they'll continue to get better over time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's everyone's going to make their own individual case-by-case -case decision. And similarly, this is probably true for all all big consumer goods or houses or, or electric cars, the, the balance, the, how do you balance or the factors to consider in just buying a brand new car versus letting your existing car or house or other big item um, just keep that and maintain it for the long term? Yeah, I mean, the, the solution is certainly not let's destroy every gasoline vehicle and I'll buy a new electric vehicle, right? Like all of these vehicles took resources to make them. Um, furthermore, it's not like the manufacturers can keep up with the electric vehicle demand as it is before we would add anything else. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, continuing to drive a, a fuel efficient vehicle as long as it lasts, certainly not a bad plan. Those are the, I think those are all the questions that were in the chat or the, that we had ahead of time. Um, does, has this conversation prompted any additional questions?
Don, Nancy, Naragon, I see you thinking. I, I saw Don Naragon understanding uh, <laughs> what was going on with uh, when you were mentioning the other um, things that can go into a battery and how they, they could with lithium. I saw him getting understanding the chemistry where the rest of us were blank. He's nodding. So, Don, you might want to ask something. Well, I guess the question I always had for the feds was, who was the person that decided or why did they decide that the charging station had to be within a mile of the highway? There are a lot of towns that are a little further away than that that would be delighted to put in a, a charging station and they would be delighted if you would uh, um, use if, uh, and purchase goods from their restaurants and the other shops in town. Why the uh, one mile limit? Yeah, so I mean, it's it is a, a requirement that they made through through regulation. So they, they put out a draft rulemaking. There was an extensive public comment process, um, and they it was you know one of the hot topics. Uh, I mean, probably some of the, main, the the biggest topics were what is the power, power level requirement, what is the spacing requirement. You know, it had different things like that. Um, the the one mile really came from a perspective of you know no one has to drive more than a mile off of the highway to get to a gas station. You know, the gas station is always right there. So it wouldn't be fair for the electric vehicle to have to drive much farther. Um, that being said, like sometimes there's not something within a mile, right? So we do have an exception process that we can pursue, but we would have to prove that, you know, along this stretch of highway, we don't have a suitable location within a mile, or at least not a suitable location someone is interested. So we want to go for this place that's 1.5 miles. You know, and then we could we could pursue their their approval on that. Um, and then I'll also just note like that that is the the step one of this program is is those alternative fuel corridors. After that is completed, you know, we'll we'll still have funds remaining. Uh, one of the things that we talk about in the mobility plan is we laid out what we call routes of significance, basically our secondary and tertiary roadways that interconnect all these major roadways. Um, and especially, you know, most of the rural parts of the state, like. I-80 is about the only thing going through the, the north central part of the state. There's a lot of other connecting roads up there that would be important to enable electric vehicle mobility. So it might make sense. We'll go, we'll be going through, you know, public comment process, um, community engagement to, to figure out what people want us to do. But one of the thoughts that we'll be presenting is, should we be putting in something similar to NEVI? Maybe it's two plugs, or, or maybe it's maybe it's only two DC fast plugs instead of four. Maybe it doesn't have to be as much. But should we have a similar network along these, you know, secondary and tertiary roadways? Um, and there may, and there's also going to be, you know, what communities need charging. Where, where is there a lot of, um, you know, tourism where people are coming in from long distances? Uh, there's there's towns in particular that that we've heard just like you, you know, hey, we're three miles from the interstate. We have a lot of tourists coming here. We we really want them to come to our town, not use the gas station right off the highway. So, you know, we've we've definitely heard that. And, you know, at, at this point, like that's the rule we've been given. That's what we're working with. Um, but you know, once we have more flexibility, we'll we'll be seeing what everyone what everyone wants from these projects to continue the build out. Okay, another question on the uh, large solar installations, the, the batteries are now sodium ion based primarily. They are big and uh, not a suitable weight for a car. Do you have any ideas or have you heard anything about what I would call the miniaturization of a sodium battery to be suitable for use in a uh, EV? Yeah, so I mean, anything and everything in terms of battery chemistries is being explored and researched when it comes to, you know, we, we, we've lithium ion rechargeable really started the era of, of batteries taking off and now it's just once lithium ion proved that it could be done they're, they're trying it with anything and everything i mean there's lithium air there's um sodium ion is is one of the ones that i have seen a little bit about um like you said energy density can be a big problem you know with with our car batteries we really need them to be energy dense um that's that's one of the main advantages of lithium ion uh, but yeah um I, I don't know, I've not seen anything to, to say that there's something close. Um, lithium sulfur seems to be the next one that that's, they're thinking likely to be practical and, and could be implementable. Um, but like I said, there's so many things being looked at 
it'll probably be the one that we never guessed will be the one that has a breakthrough and in 10 years that's what everything will be right <laughs> we um how do we find out about ongoing plans and proposals where you will be asking for public comment yeah so i mean we have our um we have an email list for like the nevi program that we use for, for anything related to electric vehicles so like if we were to have um like public engagement sessions we would announce them through that so anyone interested can, can let me know and i can i can add you to that list um we also have you know our, our ev website on pendot's webpage. you can you can find um you know the latest and updates there as well if i'm, I'm as i'm already signed up as as program director for the no, the DEP notices of any number of things. Would that include UC work that PennDOT is doing or is there a similar e-notice e just for PennDOT that I could uh, add my name to? I can double check. So um, I, I can look and see if you're there. And then and obviously if we send something out you think is relevant for other people, you can pass it along. Great. Uh, and then how can our individual members find out if their local municipality uh, is either already planning to have public charging stations or they would like them to? What's the best way to encourage our respective townships or boroughs uh, to have a public charging station and be aware of the funding and other assistance that's available? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the, the best way for your, um, like, you know, that that sort of like uh, government affairs, um, you know, that, that sort of stuff, I, I don't know. Um, I know there's there's a lot of different things that a local government can do. So there's um, another slide or two that I, that I add in here when it's um, a local government uh, presentation. But, you know, it, it's not just our municipality is going to put in a charging station. Um, there's a lot of other things they can do. They can make sure they don't have a permit process that's onerous. Um, they can really go the extra mile and they can say whenever there's new construction, you're required to have a certain percentage of the charging station, a certain percentage of the parking spaces ready for a charging station. You know, put in the electrical lines now so that it's ready for, for when you want to put in charging stations later because it costs a lot less to do that when you build the building than, than tearing up concrete later. Um, so there's a variety of things that, that they can be doing. Um, and yeah, I mean, certainly letting them know that that you're interested, you know, can play into that. We had a uh, a comment that thanked you for your presentation, that you were very clear, and um, and and wanted to know if there's a way to get your slides, because she could not. I don't think. I think we all had a hard time keeping up and taking thorough notes. But if there's a way to get a copy of your your slides, that'd be really terrific. Yep, I can send them along to you. Great. Uh, any other questions or comments? It seems to me that while we're in the process of setting this up, we should make sure that after the five year um, period is up, there should be some statewide uh, oversight of charging stations so that some areas don't end up being sort of in a charging station desert because no one's maintaining or watching over these things. Is there anything like that in the plans? Yeah, so a um, couple of pieces there. So like first, when it comes to like making sure the proper you know operation of the charging station, um, things like that, you know, when it's a funded charging station, like we have a lot of we have a lot of things we can do there. We have a contract with them. Um, we can ensure a lot of things. Uh, when it comes to, um, so like one one topic is weights and measures. You know, like your gas station is, is overseen by the division of weights and measure, measures. They make sure that you get the right amount of gas for how much you're paying, stuff like that. At this point, um, there's actually no equipment that's certified to test charging stations. Um, the main problem is the heat sink. You know, you plug into 150 kilowatts of power, it has to go somewhere. <laughs> um, so they haven't really developed a, a piece of equipment that can take that much power um, 
one of the ideas they're exploring is just having like a flame shower shooting out like uh but but eventually they'll have one of those they'll be able to test these equipment they'll be able to certify and say like hey this this has been approved by us the main thing that really comes into play is the uptime so that's why the ones that were funding through nevi our government says they have to have 97 percent uptime um but you know really like no one regulates your gas station and says it has to be available 99 percent of the time like that's that's in their best interest like it just happens um and eventually it's, it's going to have to be similar with charging stations like once there's demand for them then people will complain when they're not working and a lot of people will complain when they're not when they're not working and and they'll have every incentive to keep them uh, up and running um I mean, I, I don't know what the mechanism would be from a government perspective to, you know, mandate performance of charging stations that we had no funding for. Like, that's just, it, it's not something that happens with gasoline stations. So I don't, I don't know what that piece would be. I mean, as for the time being, while there are much lower demand places, that that's where these funding programs come into play. You know, hey, we've identified this area does not have enough demand for a private entity to come in and do a charging station on their own. So we need to fund one here to get it up and going. Because once there's a charging station, people feel comfortable and confident buying an electric vehicle. Once there is local demand, then the market supports itself and it keeps going. So like that's, that's the idea. Like we should not be funding charging stations forever. Um, but hopefully we can we can kickstart it and and then it will be self-sustaining. We had just another question of um at a charging station is how many cars can plug in at one time? Yes, that would just depend on how many plugs are there. So, you know, like the charging stations that we're funding have to have at least four plugs um, and at, at that 150 kilowatt power level. So, and then the, the power level is what's gonna determine how long you're there, right? If it's a level two charge at work, you're gonna be plugged in for two to four hours um, and maybe every break or every lunch break, you know, people swap out and so like I've, I've, I've seen an employer that had two plugs that was being shared by like 19 people because they were just constantly going out and swapping. Um, but then, you know, something like, uh, something more like the convenience store model, you have a really high power station, so that way you can plug in. And in the 15, 20 minutes that you go inside and come back out, your vehicle has enough of a charge that you're on your way. So, so you can have a pretty good turnover rate. Um, the number of people at a time is just gonna be based on plug count. Okay. Well, I know I'm leaving this with my head stuffed with lots of new information <laughs> and a lot of um, both technical and lots of ideas, I think, for going forward with our group and with our respective communities. And um, well, I really appreciate your spending time this evening yeah. uh, to uh, tell us all about electric cars. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time this evening. A very clear presentation. I look forward to getting the slides. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. See you. Yep. It's going. <clears throat>